go ahead and pray, and we got a great word for you from the book of Jeremiah. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we give you glory today. You are our God and King. We love you so much. Thank you for visiting us this morning during the time of musical worship. Lord, would you continue to hover over us by the power of the Holy Spirit and by your angels this morning as we dive into your word here in just a second. Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear exactly what you want to speak to each of us? And then would you give us the power to put it into practice in our everyday life in Jesus' name? And everybody says... Amen. Amen. So there's like a 70s song that was written about the stuff that we're getting ready to read today. How many of you are old enough to remember like, Jeremiah was a book. Um, so that song was not written about the stuff that we're getting ready to share today, I promise you. But in the book of Jeremiah, we're going to experience some good stuff. And, you know, I just think back to what God's been stirring in our heart already. We've seen a number of conditional promises as we've gone along the way in the book of the Old Testament. And today we're going to get some promises, but as God always does in the gospel, he challenges our heart in certain areas of sin that we need to get them out of our lives. And the only way we could truly do that is being touched by God. And then he gives us some hope. And if you weren't here last week, I want to encourage you to download the Journey Church app or go online where you could watch last week's message. We got a powerful glimpse glimpse of that in the book of Isaiah as he entered into the very throne room of God and got to see it in the spirit and he was touched on his lips by the angels and his sins were forgiven. It was just a powerful scene of this epic battle that continues to go on around us in the spiritual realms that leads into our own generation and Jeremiah was given some prophecies also for our own generation that we're seeing fulfilled but his was an amazing life and and uh, I think that it's going to do something in us today to continue to unlock that potential that I talked about a couple weeks ago, that God has a calling on your life. He has potential that's there. And sometimes through sin, sometimes through the pain of life, that gets suppressed. But God has a great call on your life that he wants you to live out. And some of you just heard that and you're like, no, it can't be because you find yourself at a place where life's really tough right now. You're going through some things, and the devil's thrown some stuff your way, and you've added to it by some of your own decisions, and it's hard to believe that God still has a purpose and a plan for your life, but I assure you that he does. No matter how low you feel here in this place today, he loves you, he cares for you, he died for you, he wants to see you thrive, he wants to see you live a life of purpose and meaning, he wants to see you, and he does see you as an overcomer. Can I get an amen to that? The Bible uses this word called calling. We're going to experience it just a little bit here as we open up this book. I believe he implants a life mission on each of us that he gives us a job to do as believers and will never truly be fulfilled until we're walking in our calling. May he unlock that in you this very day. So we're in our last couple of days in the Old Testament. In fact, there's two more sessions in the Old Testament. Next week, we're going to talk about Jonah. And then the following week, we're going to talk about the book of Malachi. And then we're going to transition into the New Testament. But today, we find ourselves in Jeremiah chapter 1, starting in verse 4. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you or called you to be a prophet to the nations. Think about that for a moment. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. God knew you. He had a purpose and a plan for your life. Guess what? That means you are not an accident. You, do you get that? You know, for much of my early life, I felt that I was an accident, right? My mom started dating a guy when she was about 19 years old that became her boyfriend. It was a very short-lived relationship. She got pregnant very early on in that relationship. She grew up as a Catholic, so abortion was out of the question, but guilt and shame were not, right? So she felt this sense of remorse. She felt this sense of guilt. She felt this sense of shame. But she also knew that abortion was not part of the equation because of the way that she grew up. So at the age of 19, she tells this man or boy man in her life that she is pregnant and he ran the other way, right? 
He's like, no way. I've got my whole life before me. I've got a career that I want to live out. I've got money that I want to make. And he, rather than doing the right thing, so to speak, or trying to see this thing out, he chose a different idol, an idol of money, an idol of career. He chose to ignore the fact that I existed. I met him one time when I was 40 years old, and that was it. And then he unfriended me from Facebook afterwards. So I don't know what I said after that. It must have been very bad. You know, but... Um, I just never knew him, and he never played any kind of role in my life. So as a young kid growing up, what are you going to think, you know? I don't remember what age it was that I realized that I didn't have a dad. You know, I don't know if it was five or six when I first started going to school and the other kids were coming with their parents and they were showing up. Um, you know, I, I was blessed to have a great extended family. My mom had seven brothers and sisters that were there. We had grandparents that came and tried to help us, and they were there for us during those experiences. So love was not lacking in the house. Everybody tried to do their part and tried to help us and was there for us as we grew up. And, you know, we were really blessed, but it was not like it didn't have ramifications, though. You know, I had issues because of that. I felt unworthy. I felt unwanted when I started to come to the age where I could realize that. Where's my dad? Where's the guy who's supposed to be sewing into my life? Where's the guy who's supposed to teach me how to ride a bike? My mom taught me to ride a bike, and I'm still a sissy today. I'm telling you, it just didn't work out too good with certain things that were kind of manly in nature, you know? So uh, I, I got issues, you know? Thank you. Jesus, help me, you know? But uh, I would pause and even say right now, if you are a single mom in here, you know, forgive me for not telling you that we love you enough. Wow, you guys have a big job that's there before you. Know that you're not alone. Don't go at it alone. You know, there's tons of ladies small groups and other small groups that we have. People that would love to be in your life, would love to be there to help you, would love to walk alongside of you, to be an extended family for you, um, to just be a part of your life. So please don't go at it alone. The church loves you, we love you, and we want to be there for you. Amen, amen, and amen. So I don't know, I do know that it affected me. I know in my later years it had implications in my drug use, my self-esteem, even my relationship with God. How do you trust God if you didn't have a father in your life? My, my stepdad, who I, I love to call dad, who I've known since I've been five years old, got adopted me when I was 13. It's his 80th birthday today. I don't think you're watching, but dad, we love you. Happy birthday. <laughs> Excited for you. 80 years and still doing great and going strong. We got to talk to him this morning. What a blessing. So your story might be different than mine, but once I realized, coming to be a believer, that God had his eye on me before I was even born, it did start to do something in me. You, you mean I'm not an accident? You mean that even though it appeared in the natural that I was an accident, that God had a purpose and a plan for my life? that he really cares for me and that he was watching out for me before I was even born. And then you start to see some little things along the way as you get older where God stepped in and intervened and protected you from yourself or from other circumstances. And you're like, God was really watching all along. How cool is that? When I started to come to that realization, it began to give me hope. It began to change my perspective. He had not forgotten about me. He still cared for me. He was there all along. He was watching over me. In the midst of my sin, in the midst of my challenges, he was saying, come home. Come home. You're loved. So if you're here today and you were one of those kids like me, know that God has not forgotten about you. He loves you dearly in spite of what the devil wants to tell you, right? He loves you. He cares for you. Jeremiah 1, or 1, 4, where we read, And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So that means each of us who are believers, when we are born again, and even before we're born again, God has a purpose and a plan for our lives. Many of us live it out. Thank you, God. Others of you, you're not living it out yet. And one of the most important things you need to discover and uncover in your life is what is that purpose? What is that calling? What is that thing that's going to most glorify God about you and bring others to the saving knowledge and grace of who he is through your life and also bring you fulfillment at the same time? Some of you, your faith has gotten very stagnant. You're just going through the motions. 
It was hard for you to even show up this morning. It was hard for you to worship today. You feel distant and disconnected from God. What if you were to start walking in your calling? What if you were to start walking in what you were created for? Would it add a new energy to your life? Would it add a new energy to your relationship with him? You see, the devil's going to do everything he can to thwart you from that. And sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot with our own sin and lack of repentance over those matters, right? So then we don't live out what he's called us to do. And then, the, then guess what? Christianity's really boring. And you feel defeated at that point. Your life has no meaning and you're wondering why. Man, I'm telling you, you need to figure that out. Get in his word. Men, go to man church. Start out with authentic manhood. What a great way to begin to position yourself with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of the calling that's in your life. Otherwise, also just look to some of the things in the natural. You don't have to get super deep about it. What do you like to do? Where do you find fulfillment in things that are not sinful? Amen, right? Where do you find fulfillment, right? If you can find those things, maybe God put those desires in your heart for a reason because he wants you to use those as a means of bringing him glory and drawing other people into a relationship with him. So he's called us and consecrated us and appointed us before we were even born. That means he's allowed you to go through the bad stuff that you've gone through. He's actually allowed you to walk through it and come out on the other side still standing because it formed you and shaped you. He's allowed you to have the great joys over certain things in your life because that's how he formed you and shaped you. And he wants to use those things in your life. He loves you and cares for you is the bottom line of all this that I'm saying. So if God has done that, if he's consecrated you and appointed you before you were born, why has he done that? So you can fulfill your calling. So what is your first and foremost calling as a believer in Jesus Christ? To worship God and enjoy him forever. To focus on that relationship with him, right? For those of us who are married, the next job is to our wives. To those of us who have children, the next job is to your children. After that, it's your vocation and your hobbies and the other things that we have in our life. But we need to keep those things in order because when they get out of order, they can start to cause us some problems, right? Have you ever noticed that? None of you have ever had any problems. I don't see anybody shaking their head. Everybody's lives are just perfect all the time. Some of it also has to do with location and calling. So in my calling as a pastor, it took me a long time to realize what that was. First and foremost, I didn't even think of the city of Jacksonville. It was not on my radar at all. It was not a place I ever dreamed of. It was that smelly city that you used to drive through on your way to North Carolina back in the day because they had all of those um, paper mills that used to be here back in the day. Some of you are old enough to remember that. You young people, you don't even use paper anymore. You got like the tablet and everything's all good, right? But this place used to smell stank, I'm telling you. Back in the day, we would drive through. I remember as kids. And then when uh, I remember, I think I was telling my mom and dad that we got a job offer to go to Jacksonville. She's like, I think that place smells. Are you sure you want to go there, you know? They had all gone by the year 2000 when we moved to Jacksonville. So God used other ways to get us to come up here. He used a job offer and a different career to get us to come here. But in 2003, we began to discover our true calling, our calling to be a pastor, our calling to lead the people of God and bring them hope and share the good news of the gospel full time in that regard, right? God, God unleashed that. But my calling's different than your calling. Guess what? Some of you are called to be the best moms ever raising your kids. Some of you, that's your calling. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that, right? If you divorce God from that equation, you will end up in big trouble though, right? Some of you are called to be the best workers ever, earning all kinds of money to make a difference for Jesus. You're called to live out the gospel in the midst of your workplace, sharing the good news with the vendors that you encounter, with the clients that you encounter, and with the coworkers who you work alongside. That's your calling, right? You're there to make a difference in the workplace where God has planted you. Some of you lift weights with all the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, like you could lift weights, you can enjoy your hobbies, you could go bowling, you could go jet skiing, you could do all the things that you enjoy to do if you do them for the glory of God, right? God put those joyful things that you enjoy on your heart so that when you're in that culture and you're around those people, you could share the good news of the gospel, not just with your mouth, but with the way that you live it out, right? 
You don't have to shy back in the workplace. Can I get an amen? You don't have to shy back when you're in the workplace. When you're at work, would we act like Jesus? Would we talk about what our faith means to us? I promise you, if you do that, people will be drawn to you. Jeremiah 1.6. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. Jeremiah 1.7, but the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a youth, for to all whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and, deliver, and will deliver you, declares the Lord. So is it scary to do things like share our faith in those contexts? Yes, it is at times, right? Jeremiah was scared too. He was going to have to tell some people some very hard things. But what God's saying here is that he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He'll be there with us. He'll bring you the right words to say at the right time and the right moment to the right person. How different would your life be if you prayed for divine appointments? Lord, would you put people in my path who need to know you? Would you use me as an instrument for your glory? Would I live it out in my everyday lives? Would my words and actions be in alignment with one another so that people don't call me a hypocrite, right? We all are to some degree, right? But thanks be to God, we are forgiven. That doesn't mean we need to continue to live that way, though, right? We need to change. I had a pretty neat thing happen recently. Um, I, w I recently sold my business, and they had a opportunity for both of the teams to begin to gather together and I happened to sit next to a young lady that was about my daughter's age and she was so excited she was saying man I was praying that something like this would happen I was praying that God would send us other believers that would help us build this business so instantly I knew that she's a believer right this young girl 20 something years old is sharing with me about praying and I'm like okay all of a sudden my God radar goes on right and I'm like wow that's pretty cool she doesn't know that I'm a pastor I have an opportunity to hear, hear this story. And in fact, she didn't get too many more words out of her mouth when the HR director actually walked up to me and then she started criticizing her for, no, I'm teasing. <laughs> Thank God, right? So that does happen sometimes. You got to be prepared for that, right? So the HR director actually walks up to me and she goes, do you know this girl who you're talking to? She was a hot mess. She had all kinds of issues and she had all kinds of challenges and she had all kinds of pain and she got to the end of a rope and we kept sharing Jesus with her. And I'm like, oh, come on, who are these people that I'm getting to talk with, right? The, the, the older lady is there sharing with this young lady. As it turns out, she picked up her story and she said that her and her husband had had some really hard times and sadly they ended up getting a divorce and she really came to that point where she was at the end of a rope and she had nowhere to go, but she, she actually declared herself at that time to be an atheist where she was making fun of the older ladies that were there in the office who were talking about Jesus, but then she got at that low moment in her life and they came up to her and they said, look, you don't have many options to go. You either go with us to church or you can keep going down this sad road that you're going to, and she ended up going to church and got saved. How awesome is that, right? She shared, they shared the good news with her, guess what? She's young in her faith. She's saying all this stuff to me and she's probably been a believer for like four or five months. Four or five months. Let us not forget our first love, church. Remember what it was like during those days. She didn't care. To her, I was like a new boss that's coming in. She's sharing to me about brand, sharing with me about Jesus. She didn't care what anybody thought about her. So then we started talking about selling and it was, it was kind of funny. Um, she said, you know, this other guy was telling me about tithing. And she goes, I was scared. I'm a single mom now. I'm trying to figure this stuff out. She, but I, I did it. I actually did it. And that week I sold my first two jobs in one week. I'm like, come on, Lord, right? How neat is that? That God's using those moments to, you know, affirm her faith and continue to grow her up. He's, he's, taking every little inch and step that she was taking and he was giving it up to her and boosting it up. How amazing is that? He wants to do the same thing for you. If your faith has gotten stale, if your faith has gone by the wayside, let me tell you, he wants to lift you up. Her life was completely turned around. Could your life be completely turned around too? Now, might there be challenges? Might there be different HR people in your office than were at hers, right? 
Certainly, right? Jeremiah was not without some challenges. Jeremiah certainly had some pains because, you know, most of us, I think, living out and saying things like, I want to pray, I want to do certain things, this is how I live my life, is, is an easy thing. You want to see people get really mad at you? Start calling out sin where it needs to be called out. Whoa, right? Say, so you need to repent because this is going on in your life, right? Not in a judgmental way, but you'd be like, this is going on in your life, you need to repent, right? That was Jeremiah's calling, to call people out and tell them to repent. Jeremiah 2.1, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to me saying, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, thus saith the Lord, remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness and the land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. It starts out really well. Like us, when we first became believers, we're fired up, we're excited, we're, we're seeing all this newness, we're seeing God move for the first time. Our faith is not yet dulled, and everything we experience is new and beautiful, right? But then sadly, our faith sometimes gets dulled along the way, and that's what we're experiencing here. He's starting out in a very good way, saying, hey, this is good stuff, remember what it was like in your youth, but then the calling on Jeremiah's life was to call them out because they had allowed their faith to get dull. They were falling back into their old sinful patterns and behaviors. They were continuing to live like they were unbelievers before the world and displaying and not giving God glory, but they began to live for what the Bible calls idols. They began to put things in their life first to that place that God should only have. Do you think idols still exist in our generation? Are you sure? I haven't seen any of those Asherin poles we thought they used to worship back then. They certainly do. What are the idols in our generation? Somebody said football. Is that what they said? No. Money, comfort, self. Comfort, entertainment, covetousness, lust. What are all the things we see on the TV all the time? What are the things that infiltrate our hearts? Now I'd ask you to examine your heart for a second though. Have some of those things, even as a believer, begin to captivate your heart to a place they shouldn't? How much time are you spending, say, on Facebook or on TV versus spending time with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? What's captivating your heart? What's drawing your attention? I'm saying it in a pretty nice way. Jeremiah would have went, Whoop, <laughs> But I don't make light of it, right? I mean, it's serious because this is what they were dealing with. If you're reading God's word here in Jeremiah, he's saying, all of you, many of you in here, you've already given your life to the Lord. You were like that new believer, fired up. Now your faith's dulled. Why is it dulled? One of the major reasons that he witnessed there was a lack of repentance. A lack of humility, a lack of putting God in the place that he should have and allowing all these other things to creep in and take over to a place that they shouldn't. And he called them out on it as I'm doing to you today and saying, church, are there things that have taken a place in your life that they shouldn't have taken? If they are, our response like Isaiah's last week is to say, man, surrender your life to God once again today. Recommit your heart to him. Say, from this day forward, Lord, I will serve you. I will set aside these things. I need your help because I can't do it on my own. I'm addicted to these certain things. I can't put the phone down. and It's messing my life up. I don't have the relationships with my family that I'm supposed to have. I can't put work down because it's become an idol. I'm working all day and all night trying to get money. And guess what? It doesn't seem like I'm ever getting ahead. And I'm putting my family by the wayside. Maybe it's lust in your life. Maybe it's covetousness over something else. What, what's bothering you? What's ailing you? What's holding you back from living out your calling in Jesus Christ? To get to that place where you can experience true joy in him, it might start in humble repentance. Saying, Lord, would you help me? That's not a message that's popular in our day. And it wasn't a message that was popular in Jeremiah's day. You think they listened to him? Sadly, they didn't. Most didn't. Some did. Most didn't. And they ended up suffering for a very long time. So much so that they are experiencing some of that suffering even into our own generation. The temple that was built during those other generations ends up being destroyed in 73 AD. And Jeremiah is prophesying something that was to come many, many, many years later. Jeremiah 29, 11. 
He says this, may we bring us back from that place of repentance to the place of hope. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you shall come and call upon me and come and pray with me, and I will hear you. For if you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. So let's start with the prophecy first, and then we'll go back to this hope for our own generation. Worship team, you can make your way back up onto the stage. So in our generation, whenever I talk about Israel, I get excited. And actually, he's prophesying in that second part about Israel. It's saying, from all the ends of the earth that Israel would return to Israel, all the Jewish people would return to the land of Israel, that prophecy is being fulfilled in our generation. We've talked about this before. We live in a miraculous time. May this build your faith. I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it. I mean, the fact that Israel needed to become a nation again after 2,000 years, from AD 73, it wouldn't exist. Everybody was dispersed. Everybody was sent away. No nation on the earth has ever come back to be a nation again. No language that has ever gone away has ever come to be the na language of a nation. Now the default language of six point something million Jews that live there today. So they came from that dispersion and fulfillment of Jeremiah chapter 29. And today in our generation, we're witnessing the fulfillment of this very scripture. May that build your faith. We've seen it happen from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. People are returning there. They call it the Aliyah, the Aliyah. It's happening right now before our very eyes. How about that other set of verses? He says, if you seek me, you'll find me. If you'll repent, you'll find him. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? He says he has a future and a hope and a plan for you. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. But where does it start? It starts in repentance. It starts by saying, God, I need you. It starts by surrendering our lives to the true king of the universe, Jesus, and laying aside our idols in our own generation and asking him to come into our hearts and fill us for the very first time. Or for some of you whose faith has been dulled over the years, to renew your faith and bring you back from that place of exile and take you to a land where you could flow in your calling, where you could fulfill that which God's called you to do, where you could have joy for the first time or renewed joy again, knowing that you are saved, that you are delivered, that you are not an accident, that God knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb, that he cares for you. How amazing is that? I hope some of you are excited about that. If you are, here's what I'd like to do. If you know today's a day where you need to either dedicate your life to Jesus or rededicate your life to Jesus, man, I would love to have the honor of joining hands with you and praying for you and with you. I promise I will do nothing to embarrass you. But to, if today's that day where you need to say, God, I need you, whether for the first time or as a renewed act of your faith, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand up real high right where you're at with nobody looking around? If that's you, I'd love to pray for you. I see your hand and yours and yours and yours and yours. Thank you, God. Everybody else, put your hands together and give God a little bit of glory for that. you raised your hand, I promise not to do anything to embarrass you. I, just, I truly would love to just join hands with you, congratulate you, and pray with you. If you didn't raise your hand and wanted to, you're welcome to come up as well. If that's you, would you come up to the front if you raised your hand? Do that right now. Everybody else around them, just cheer for them in excitement. Thank you so much. Fired up for you, man. God bless you. Thanks for coming up. God bless you. And you, God bless you. Come on up. Glad you're here. Come on up, sister. Come on, Journey. Give them glory. God bless you. Congratulations, you guys. Here's what I want to do. You can stay right where you're at. Father, I just want to pray with those who came up today. 
Lord, you're, you still move, you still love, you still care, you still bring hope and still bring purpose. And Father, we just thank you for this moment, first and foremost for them that, Father, you're working in their heart and changing them and molding them and helping them, Lord God. Whatever they've gone through, would they know today that they have worth, that you love them enough that you died, that they might have life, Lord God, that you sent your one and only begotten Son from heaven to earth to show us the way, to lead us to that path of righteousness, to give us a hope and a future. You have plans for them, Lord God, and it starts by them as well as all of us today just saying, Jesus, you truly are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. We put our hope and our future in you. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins that comes from the blood of your son, Jesus. And from this moment forward, we will live our lives for you. For those who came up, there are some people near you who would love to give you some next steps to help you start your walk of faith. For the rest of us, would we spend just a little bit more time worshiping the Lord through song. If you'd like to be prayed for over any issue that's in your life or you'd simply like to kneel down by yourself at the front, the altars are open. I'll be up here and others. We'd love to join hands with you, pray with you over whatever's going on. If you'd like to take communion by yourself or with your family, there's communion elements both to my left and my right. Let's worship the Lord with one more song. God bless you guys.
will shadow, you will light up. Mountain, you will climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. No shadow you will light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. for you as you go today. What would happen this week if that first glimpse of negativity starts to come your way, right? You're ready to get beat up for just a moment if God would bring to your memory Jeremiah chapter 29. Say, I know the plans that God has for me. He has plans for hope and for a future. What would happen that first moment that you start to feel down if God would bring this kind of a song back to your heart, that he's going after you with a reckless love, that he's not going to let you get away, that no obstacle in his path is going to stop him from reaching you because he loves you. 